Hey guys, welcome back once again to Reignited and our Budget Challenger buildup. Now, at the end of the last episode, you saw me remove the camshaft from our vehicle. And you remember when I said this? Pull these lifters out, check the condition of the roller needles on there. Being a manual transmission, I really don't think we're gonna find anything wrong with them, but pays to check anyway. Yeah, I decided to have a closer look at the camshaft itself. So I went ahead and cleaned all off all the oil, cleaned off the lifters, and I found something that I thought was very interesting. Check it out. All right, when I inspected this cam, everything was about how I'd expect it to look. All the bearing surfaces look just fine. If you look at the individual cam lobes themselves, you can kind of see a little bit of wear on the hardened surface, but again, totally normal for this age. So I was looking down, looking down, everything seems fine. Then you get down here to cylinder number seven. Oh, wow, look at that. What's going on there? We have some pitting happening on the actual lobe itself for cylinder number seven. So I took a closer look at the lifters themselves, wouldn't you know it, look at that. We have a lifter starting to fail. Now, the reason I find this so interesting is because as you know, this being a manual transmission vehicle, there is no MDS on this vehicle, there never has been. So MDS is not a factor clearly in this lifter failure. Now, I'll be honest, I didn't hear any sort of lifter failure at all with this vehicle when purchasing it or running it before I started working on it. This here is just starting to fail. So another couple of thousand miles, I would have started to hear that tick. Maybe I would have started to get that misfire on there. So this is good news. We actually caught this early. But what's interesting is that it means that it is not based on the MDS system. So we're back to some other solutions here. You know, Uncle Tony's garage, he talks about it being the cam being too high up and there being a oil gallery running right down the center of the block. So not getting splash lubrication. I still don't think that's the cause because without the MDS system in there, you're getting pressurized oil flow into the lifter galleries that's coming right down onto the roller lifters. So I don't think that's the cause of it. I think we're just looking at a QC issue here. This is part materials essentially, like the quality of metal that these are made out of. But honestly, with 124,000 miles to be getting some roller lifter failure right now, I'd kind of take that guys. It's not the worst thing in the world. Now, if you were seeing the same failure at 30,000 miles or 40 or 50,000 miles, I could certainly understand that. But 124,000 miles, just starting to get lifter failure, I could live with that. All right, well, that's all very interesting, but let's get back into our install of our camshaft. All right, so we've got our camshaft out. We've got our lifters out. I went ahead and cleaned up the cylinder heads, as you can see, and also I removed the exhaust manifolds from on there. Now, normally, if I was doing this, I would not remove the exhaust manifold from the head unless I absolutely had to. But in this case, there's a couple of reasons for doing so. One, because I wanted to clean the thing up real nice, but more importantly, because because I am installing a camshaft on here, I am actually going to be replacing these valve springs with some uprated valve springs. Now, again, we are keeping this on a budget theme. So I am doing these Mopar par performance valve springs, which are very reasonably priced so I can get a full set for fairly cheap on here. Again, these are not extreme valve springs. If you're going with a more top end cam, you'll probably want to go with the aftermarket set. However, for the 6.4 cam I'm installing, these are going to be a nice, simple upgrade that I can do. Now, again, this is one of those situations where you will need a special tool to do this particular job, but it's not really that difficult. In fact, this is what it looks like here. It essentially looks like a giant C-clamp. I'll show you how it works here in just a minute. But you can rent these from different auto parts stores, AutoZone, O'Reilly's, things like that. So just go ahead and get one of these particular style. They're pretty simple to use, not a problem. And you can rent them for fairly cheap. In fact, if you wanted to buy this thing, I saw them online for about, I think it was like 65 bucks or something like that. And then you'd have it for the next time around if you ever wanted to do it again. So let's get into changing out these valve springs. I'll show you just how simple it really is. All right, so to swap out these valve springs is actually a really simple process with this C-clamp design. What you do is the little clamshell portion here on the top end, that goes around the valve spring retainer at the top, and the flat portion here goes against the back of the valve itself. So let's do this uh, intake valve here. Basically just press it against it like that. And you push the clamp until it's tight, and then you basically heard the valve spring, or sorry, the valve retainer fall off here. Go ahead and pull the other half off. And then once you do that, you just release the clamp. Try to do that in a controlled fashion. And then retainer comes out, spring comes off. Reassembly is exactly the same as taking it off. Just take your new valve spring. Slip it back on there. Slip the retainer on. Slide it back into place, tighten it down, 
like that. And then with your valve keepers, you wanna go ahead and put some sort of a gel type of lubricant on there. That way it helps them to stick in place. I'm using this assembly goo. And you stick the keeper on there. Take your other keeper, same thing, a little bit of goo. Slide it into place. Make sure the two halves are fully seated on there. And once they are, then you just release the clamp smoothly. And there it is. You have your new valve spring installed. So now you just repeat that process for all the other ones. We'll get this head back on. Now I do wanna make a note right here that this is usually where someone shouts out and says, you're right there. Why are you not replacing the valve stem seals? Again, this is a budget build. I have had no issues with this car and it, no problems thinking that I have any sort of a valve stem seal leaking or anything like that. Of course, you are right there. So if you feel the need that you want to replace your valve stem seals, fantastic time to do that. But in this case, I don't have an issue with it. I'm just going to swap out these valve springs and move on. All right, before I actually install this SRT manifold, I just want to give you an idea of the actual physical differences between this and the stock manifold. Here's your stock one here. Gets a little thin there. So definitely going to be a flow improvement no matter what by installing these SRT style manifolds. All right, we got our cylinder heads all set here. We have the new valve springs in there and we have our SRT headers installed. Now, one thing to note with these SRT headers is that the flange is much thinner than the factory cast manifold. So you will need to change out your hardware. Your factory hardware won't work. So just run down to the hardware store, get yourself some new hardware. In this case, I went with some Allen head bolts on there. One thing I will say though, is that on the right hand side, on the passenger side top bolt, I went ahead and still used the factory stud bolt. And I went ahead and spaced it out with a nut behind here to actually give it the room to work. And the reason I did that is because the upper portion of the stud here, this is where your dipstick tube mounts to. So I still wanted to retain that mounting location. So that is the one exception. All the other holes I actually used just these new bolts I got from the hardware store. All right, we're all finished up with the cylinder heads. Now it is time for us to move on to actually installing the new camshaft. So I like to use some engine assembly lube when I'm putting in a new camshaft. You don't necessarily have to do this if you just have regular engine oil and go ahead and wipe down the lobes with the engine oil. I think you'd be just fine because if the vehicle is not sitting for a great length of time, that'll, that'll work out just fine. But I do like the assembly goo here because it's a little bit thicker. So you know it's gonna hold really well. Go ahead and just Put some little dabs on there, smear it on the lobes, and you don't have to do the entire camshaft at once. You can actually do part of it and then install part of the camshaft and then do the other lobes as they slip into the engine. Now you wanna go slow when you're installing the camshaft. Don't wanna scar up any of the camshaft bearings. So you can kind of just set it there and then add more assembly lube. Tricky part of any cam install is when you get towards the very end, it's hard to get any leverage on the end of the camshaft to pick up the rear of it. So just stick a long bolt in there, help give you something to lever off of. There we go. There we go. Cam is installed. <laughs> 
Once you get the camshaft installed, there's this little dowel pin on the front of the cam. That dowel needs to be at the 12 o'clock position. That will allow your camshaft sprocket to slip smoothly onto the end of the camshaft. All right, we've got our camshaft back in there. One thing you wanna remember is make sure to get your thrust plate back in place before you put the cam sprocket back on there. One of the nice features of this camshaft thrust plate is that the holes are countersunk on the front side so you can't put the plate on backwards. Now these camshaft thrust plate bolts are a T30 and they get torqued down to 106 inch pounds. All right, now it's time to get our camshaft sprocket back into place. You'll wanna make sure that you are properly aligned on the lower uh, oil pump drive gear and then go ahead and slip your cam sprocket back into place like that. All right, we know our crankshaft timing is still in place because we have not moved it since we actually removed the camshaft from the vehicle, but also you can verify that by your number one piston being at top dead center. So you wanna go ahead and loosely install your cam sprocket here. Go ahead and install the tensioner assembly on there. And after you install the tensioner, you're gonna spin the engine over about two or three different times actually four times, you're gonna spin the engine over four times, and that mark on the camshaft, that vertical line on the top of the cam sprocket, should line up 12 o'clock exactly here, and your number one piston should be at top dead center. If you've got that, you know for a fact that your timing is correct, and then you can continue on. The timing chain tensioner bolts get torqued down to eight foot-pounds. Now go ahead and remove your pin that's holding your tensioner in place, and it'll pull the chain, it'll pull the slack out of the timing chain, there we go. And again, our, our camshaft bolt is only on their finger tight right now, but we're gonna go ahead and spin this engine over two or three, sorry, four times we're gonna spin this engine over and then make sure that our timing mark on our camshaft sprocket is directly at 12 o'clock and that our number one piston is at top dead center. All right, so you can see on our camshaft sprocket, our vertical mark is at 12 o'clock and our number one piston is at top dead center. So engine timing is set. Let's go ahead and lock down that camshaft sprocket. So our torque spec on our camshaft sprocket bolt here is 90 foot pounds. All right, camshaft sprocket locked into place and the bolt is properly torqued down. We know our timing is good. The camshaft is fully installed. Now, now it's time to put our new lifter assemblies in the block. Now the lifter assemblies come in these handy little trays here that hold them in and they serve a couple of purposes. One, they have little flat sides on the lifters themselves that keep the lifters from rotating in the bores. So that's what holds them in place. And then secondly, if you have an MDS model vehicle, it'll have MDS written on the backside here and it will tell you whether the set you have is for the front or the rear of the engine. That way you don't get them mixed up when you're installing them. This being a manual transmission, I do not have the MDS, so these lifters are just going right in. These lifter holder bolts are eight millimeter and they get torqued down to nine foot pounds. Now, a couple of things to note about these lifters. I am using factory parts. I do recommend using factory parts when it comes to these lifters. A lot of people, they go with the cheap lifters and they tick and they rattle like crazy. Stick with the factory ones. Now, I know there are some aftermarket upgraded ones that are supposed to help out with oiling and stuff. That's fine if you wanna go that direction. For, for my part, if something has already made it 100,000 miles before it has a problem and you replace it with new ones, you're basically guaranteeing yourself another 100,000 miles that's fine. 
I, I don't think that's really a problem. And I like factory stuff. I think it's built really well. So that's what I've done. I've gone with the factory lifters here. Now, another thing to note is that these lifters have been pre-oiled to an extent. Now, some people will say, well, you should be soaking these lifters in oil for about 24 hours before you put them in. Okay, that's fine if you wanna do that too. Absolutely, I have no problem with that. For my part, I just stick them in there. They're, they are pre-oiled to an extent. They're not completely dry. So they're going to rattle. Almost any lifter, any hydraulic lifter that you're gonna have is going to have some rattle on startup while they build up to it. Not a big deal. Just as long as you're aware of that and it doesn't freak you out right from the start, it's gonna rattle a little bit when you fire it up. And then as the engine warms up, and if especially if you have an MDS model, you gotta drive the thing and let it go through a few MDS activations. Let it deactivate and reactivate the lifter a few times. After that, you give it about 20 minutes go through a full drive cycle with it, they should quiet down significantly. If you still have a really loud rattle or ticking noise after about 20 minutes of drive time, yeah, you got some sort of issue there, you're gonna wanna look into that. But rattle on initial startup when you replace your lifters, don't be too worried about it. There we go. Notice that this one says it is for the right side and that this side is the top. So you can't really screw up your gasket installation. Again, like I always mention, make sure your deck surface is fully cleaned up as, as good as you can, make sure it's good to go. And then when you put the gasket on, make sure all of your ports actually line up with everything, just to make doubly sure that you have this in the correct orientation. All right, ready for the cylinder heads. All right, these cylinder heads are not light, especially with the headers bolted onto them. So you gotta be careful when installing them. Try not to drag it across the cylinder head gasket that you just put on there. There we go. All right. And usually once I set one of these in place, what I like to do is I like to go ahead and just stick one uh, head bolt in there just to make sure it doesn't slip off of the dowels. You don't even need to tighten it, just basically having it in the, in the bolt hole is enough to keep it from slipping off. Boom, oh man, that one slipped in nice. All right, before we continue on with bolting down the cylinder heads, I wanna make a clarification regarding the cylinder head bolts of a Hemi engine. A lot of people think that when you pull the cylinder heads on these things, you just have to toss these bolts and get brand new ones every single time. That is not the case. These bolts are what's called torque to angle, not torque to yield. Torque to yield is a completely different thing where the bolts actually stretch to a proper torque specification. Those are one-time use only bolts. These are not, these are torque to angle, which is only just a torque measurement. That's it, so the bolts themselves can be reused. In fact, the factory service manual, when you take these apart, basically says, go ahead and look, inspect the threads of the cylinder head bolt itself, and see if it, you can see any signs of any stretching or necking down. If there is, then you replace the bolts with new, but if you can't find any of that, you can just reuse the head bolts with no issue. So what I do is I go ahead and use this little quarter inch impact to run the bolts down very lightly. I don't actually crank them on there. I just do it real lightly, run it all the way through. And it honestly will give you a great feel of whether or not the head is seated correctly. If at all you're getting any binding on any of these head studs here or head bolts, something has gone wrong and the, the head is not sitting flush on the deck surface, maybe not sitting properly on the dowels or something of that nature. If that is the case, take the bolts out, take the head back off and see what your obstruction is. Don't just continue to try to ram the bolts down to get it to seat, that's not a great idea. All right, our torque spec pattern here for the cylinder head bolts, the very first pass we're going to do is 25 foot pounds. We're gonna do that starting from the center and working our way outwards. The second pass is going to be 40 foot pounds. And then the final pass is an angle measurement. So it's, you're at 40 foot pounds and you do an additional 90 degrees. Now it is best if you have a torque angle meter However, 90 degrees, most people can kind of figure out if you're here, 90 degrees is going to be here, right? So you can make an educated guess based on that. Now I can say in my experience that usually once you hit that final torque measurement, you're somewhere near 100 foot pounds. We're gonna double check it on all of this and see kind of where we stand with all of those. But let's get into our first pass here and torque these down to 25 foot pounds. Mm -hmm. 
All right, first pass at 25 foot-pounds completed. Let's go ahead and ramp it up to 40 foot-pounds. All right, so both cylinder heads are torqued down to 40 foot-pounds. Let's get out the angle torque meter and we'll get this thing torqued down to our final spec. Whew, always a little bit of a workout getting those cylinder heads all torqued down. So now those are good to go. We're gonna go ahead and install these upper bolts at the top of the cylinder head. Now these get torqued down in two settings, first to 15 foot pounds and then a final torque spec of 25 foot pounds. All right, cylinder heads are fully on. Now let's go ahead and put our push rods back in and we're gonna put our rocker arms back on. And there's a couple of things I wanna show you with the rocker arms. All right, when you're putting the push rods back in, the short push rods go in the intake side and the longer push rods go in the exhaust side. All right, real quick, while installing these push rods, I wanna talk about the two biggest issue I see by far when people try to do this at home in their own garage or whatever. These are the two biggest mistakes when they put these things back together. By and large, this is a, a very simple engine and very straightforward, but there are a couple of uh, things that can trip you up and this is one of them. A lot of times people do this job, they, they do a cam lifter job or something like that and they put it all back together and they say, man, this thing's misfiring like crazy and it wasn't doing that before, what did I do wrong? Well, usually it's one of two things and this is always my very first suggestion of things to check out if it's misfiring after this kind of a job. The first thing, I want you to pull this rocker arm or pull the, pull the valve cover back off and take a look at your rocker arm and your push rods. The two biggest things that people mix up here is that one, they do not get the push rod fully seated in the end of the lifter. It is actually easy on these push rods to actually have them set down to where they're actually setting right next to the end of the lifter, not in the lifter. And it feels like it's seated, but it's not. That's usually one of the issues. The second issue, and this is by far the most common one, is that the ball end of the push rod itself slips out of the pocket in the rocker arm. It's really, really easy to get these things to where they look like they're seated, but they're not actually fully in there. And as soon as the engine goes through a full revolution, ting, it pops out from that rocker arm. And then you no longer have valve actuation on that cylinder. So again, that's always my very first suggestion for people. Pull that valve cover back off, look at your push rods, see if they're fully seated or not. My recommendation is always that after you install the push rods, get your rocker arms back on here, get everything torqued down. And if you think you have everything right, before you put that valve cover on, go ahead and spin the engine over at least a few revolutions. Make sure you see all your rocker arms actuating properly as they should, and make sure none of your push rods pop out of the rocker arms. I generally like to do the exhaust rockers first because they're actually a lot easier to set into place and make sure that they're properly seated. And the exhaust ones, you can at least visually see whether or not the push rods are seated, whereas the intake ones can be much more difficult. These rocker arm stand bolts get torqued down to 16 foot pounds. You can clearly see that the ball end of the push rod is fully seated in the rocker arm. And again, you're able to check all of them by doing so. That's the exhaust side. So again, the exhaust side is the easy side. Most of all the problems I see are on the intake side because that is much more difficult to verify. If there's any step of this process you want to take your time on, it's right here to verify that those push rods are fully seated in the rocker arms. You kind of just have to do it by feel because there's no direct line of sight. You just reach back there with your finger, try to verify that it's seated. But again, after you do that, let's go ahead and roll the engine over a couple of times just to verify. I'm going to go back through and do one more pass on all the rocker stand bolts, make sure they're all torqued properly. So the Hemi engines come with these inner valve cover gaskets that basically seal up your spark plug tubes. So if you're going to change your spark plugs and you're getting a lot of oil on the spark plug itself, usually on the threads, it's probably because these guys are all dried out and failing. So good time to replace them. Another tip for you while you're putting in these valve cover gaskets, 
Don't start at one end and work your way to the other end because the gasket will end up all floppy and weird. It'll extend past it like a half an inch. And you'll be like, what's wrong? This thing doesn't fit at all. What you wanna do is go around and each spot where there's a little bend, go ahead and press fit it in there all the way around the whole circumference. And then you go ahead and press in the areas in between. What happens is as you're pressing it along, you're actually stretching it out as it goes and it just continues and continues until by the time you get to the end, it's a little bit too long. So like I said, go ahead and just press it in place where all the bends are first, get the whole circumference seated and then go back and do all of the straight sections. All right, perfect. We're fully seated on the valve cover gasket. Now let's go back over to the car. I wanna show you one more tip while we install it. All right, so this is another very, very common issue I see on the Hemi engines when people are rebuilding these things. I've done it a few times myself. It's just one of those things that happens, but hopefully you can prevent it by knowing this little tip. As you're putting the valve cover back on, especially on this passenger side over here, it can be very difficult sometimes to get it to slip over the top of the rocker stands and really seat down flush. Sometimes you'll be in there kind of wrestling with it a little bit and fighting it. And what happens is, as you're trying to get it over the edge of the valve cover, it'll pull the valve cover gasket out of place or roll it until it's no longer seated properly. You won't be able to tell that, you don't notice it, you don't feel it, you bolt everything down, everything seems fine, and then you have an oil leak and it leaks directly onto your exhaust manifold so you get that wonderful smell of burning oil. So my tip is this, watch this back corner very closely as you go in and try not to hit the seal at all. Try to get this thing to slip over that rocker stand smoothly. I know it's tempting to kind of just wrestle with it until it gets over there, but I can almost guarantee you that you will roll the seal if you do that. So just keep a very close eye on that and get this thing installed. So this is basically what I was talking about here. You got these rocker stands with the bolts and they stick up quite a bit and it makes it really difficult to slip that valve cover over that corner. However, this is where you just need to be a little bit gentle with it and get it slipped over smoothly because trust me, pulling this thing back apart after it's already together to reseat this seal into its groove is a huge pain in the butt. So just try to avoid that at all costs. And I'll also say the more square you can get it over the rocker stands, the easier it will drop into place. There we go. Now is a good time to take a flashlight, a mirror, anything you can, stick it back in that corner there and verify that the seal itself is not rolled. Again, you do not want to deal with this after it's all back together again. It pays to take a couple extra minutes and double check it before you bolt it down. All right, you guys, that's gonna do it for episode two. The support for this series has been fantastic so far. Keep that going, I really, really appreciate it. Hope you learned something new, and I also hope you're looking forward to episode three. We'll see you next time on Reignited.